when you delete a file, it disappears from your screen. But what really happens inside your computer? Is the file instantly erased? Or is it still hiding somewhere? And how can experts sometimes recover deleted files years later? In this video, we'll break it down step by step, starting with the basics of how your computer actually stores data in sectors and blocks, then what really happens when you press delete, and finally, how files can sometimes be recovered or completely destroyed. Let's get started. When you delete a file on Windows, it usually goes to the recycle bin. On a Mac, it moves to the trash. From there, you can restore it or empty the bin if you are sure you don't need it. But even when you empty the recycle bin or trash, the process isn't what most people think. Your operating system doesn't rush to wipe the actual contents of the file. Instead, it makes a quick update to the file system. The set of rules and records that track which files live where on your storage drive. To really understand what's going on when a file is deleted, we first need to look at how data is stored in sectors, blocks, and pointers. Once that picture is clear, the whole mystery of deletion versus destruction will make sense. Inside every computer, storage drives are divided into tiny chunks called addressable units. An addressable unit is the smallest piece of storage the computer can directly read from or write to. Without this structure, the system wouldn't know where to place or find data. It would be like trying to deliver mail to the city with no house numbers. On traditional hard drives, the unit is called a sector, usually 512 bytes or sometimes 4 kilobytes. On modern SSDs, the equivalent is often called a page. But the principle is the same. Each unit has a unique address, like an apartment number, so the system can say, store this piece of the file in unit 1050, and later retrieve it from the exact same place. Operating systems usually group multiple sectors or pages together into blocks, commonly 4 KB each. Blocks are the standard building units that file systems work with. A file is broken into chunks and written across one or more blocks. To manage all this, the file system keeps a map or index. For example, file A goes to block 10 to 15, file B goes to blocks 20 to 25. And these references are pointers. They don't hold the file's content only directions to where the content lives. So when you save a file, your computer doesn't just dump data randomly. The file system keeps an index, basically a map, that links each file name to the exact blocks on disk where its data is stored. So here, bitemark icon.jpg points to block 10 through 12. Bitemark block.docx sits in blocks 20 and 21, and bitemark youtube mp4 spans blocks 30 to 33. Now watch what happens when we delete bitemunk block.docx. The first thing the operating system does is update the file system's metadata. That means the pointer, the entry that says this file belongs to these blocks, is removed from the index. From the file system's perspective, the file no longer exists. The entry disappears from the index, and those blocks are simply marked as free space. But the data inside blocks 20 and 21 is still there, untouched, until something new comes along to overwrite it. So after deletion, the file disappears from your folder view because the pointer is gone. But underneath, the raw bytes may remain in place, waiting to be overwritten by new files. On traditional hard drives, this data can linger for days, weeks, or even longer if the blocks aren't reused. On SSDs, the situation is more complex because of background garbage collection, which can erase blocks much sooner. And that's why deletion is not destruction. The index is gone, but the contents often remain. At this point, it's clear that deleting a file doesn't mean erasing it. Deletion is simply removing the pointer in the file system and marking the space as available. But the actual data, the raw bytes in those blocks, usually remain until something else happens. And that's why we say delete is not destroyed. Now, before we dive into how data is truly destroyed, I want to talk about our today's sponsor, Model. If you have ever tried to ship something compute heavy, like a voice assistant or an AI model, you know the infrastructure part is a pain be it GP availability, Docker configs, or environment setup. Model solves this. Model isn't just an AI model or a training framework. It's a foundation that powers them. It's an AI-first infrastructure platform that lets you deploy AI models without managing servers. You can get the instant GPU access, pay per second billing, and $30 in free monthly credits to get started. You write Python, deploy it, and Model handles the scaling, dependencies, and GPU allocations automatically. 
What caught my attention is who is using it. Suno, Lovable, and Meta all run on models infrastructure. When companies building serious AI products trust a platform that says something about its reliability. And here is what makes it interesting. Model spins up GPU compute in seconds and scales automatically. So if you are running an AI model live in production, it goes from zero to thousands of sessions when you need it, then scales back down when you don't. And there is no infrastructure. You are not managing clusters or writing deployment configs. Just Python code. Model figures out versioning, dependencies, and scaling on its own. You pay for what you actually use per second billing not monthly server cost that runs whether you are using them or not. They also have something called model sandboxes for teams working with AI generated code. It lets you run untrusted code safely in isolated environments that scales to 50,000 plus concurrent sessions. Companies like Lovable and Scale use it, which makes sense if you are dealing with code you didn't write yourself. So guys, if you are building something AI heavy and tired of infrastructure slowing you down, model seems to me worth checking out. The free credit means you can actually test it before committing to anything. All right, back to our deleted files. So when does destruction really happen? One way is through overwriting. When a new file is saved, the system might reuse the same blocks and physically replace the old bits. Once that overwrite happens, the original data is gone. Another way is through zeroing out or secure erase tools, which deliberately write zeros or random patterns into every byte of the block. This guarantees that the old content can't be reconstructed. On SSDs, things are a little different. The trim or TRIM command tells the drive that certain blocks are no longer in use. The SSD's controller may then erase them in the background, making recovery nearly impossible. Now, in many modern systems, especially SSDs and enterprise storage, the data written to the drive is automatically encrypted. That means the actual bytes stored in the blocks are not plain text but ciphertext, scrambled using a secret encryption key. As long as you have the key, you can decrypt those blocks back into the original file. But if the key is erased or unchanged, those encrypted blocks become useless noise. The data is still physically present on the drive, but without the key, it can't be reconstructed into anything meaningful. This method is called crypto erase or encryption based destruction. And it has two big advantages. It's almost instant. Instead of rewriting terabytes of data, the system just deletes or replaces a relatively tiny key. And it's secure. Even if someone scans the entire drive afterward, all they see is indecipherable encrypted data. And that's why many cloud providers, enterprises, and even laptops with built-in disk encryption rely on this approach. It's fast, efficient, and ensures that once the key is gone, the data is effectively destroyed, even though the blocks remain filled. And of course, there is more extreme form of destruction, physically destroying the drive, shredding, drilling, or melting it to make sure no one ever gets the data back. In short, deleting only hides data. True destruction requires overwriting, erasing, or physically destroying the medium. And because deletion only removes pointers, it means the data itself often lingers on the drive. And this is why recovery is possible. On a hard drive disk or HDD, recovery tools scan for blocks that no longer have pointers, but still contain readable data. Since the operating system hasn't zeroed them out, the tool can reconstruct the file from those raw blocks. If the file hasn't been overwritten yet, recovery can be nearly perfect. On a SSD, the story is trickier. Because of trim and wear leveling, data may be erased more quickly or written to different physical cells than before. And this makes recovery much harder and sometimes impossible. Still, if trim hasn't run yet or if certain blocks were not cleared, remnants of the file can survive. Forensic investigators rely on these principles. Even after a user deletes a file, traces can remain on Slack space, unallocated blocks, or old system snapshots. With the right tools, those fragments can be pieced back together. And this is why sensitive organizations don't rely on simple deletion. They use secure wipe utilities or full disk encryption to ensure nothing valuable can be recovered later. If you really want to make sure a file can't be recovered, you need more than just pressing delete. The big lesson is this. Delete is not destroy. Knowing the difference matters, whether you are a casual user trying to protect personal files or an engineer designing secure systems. If you enjoyed this deep dive, check out my other videos where I break down how computers and systems really work, step by step. And don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more Tech Explained Simply.